Honey, come here. It's Mike Holmes, the contractor. Contractor Rescue Show? Yeah, yeah. What was real, what was fake? I hate scripts. You hate scripts? Yeah, boom. And now we connected. Now I can talk to you. They wrote, go home niggers on the front door. <laughs> They'll take your bad experience and turn that into our situation and try to say never trust a salesman. Describe life of salesperson versus life of business owner. Whites have white trash. Blacks have ghetto. Everybody has their different. It's not color, it's class. My name is Misha and I approve this message. Today I'm interviewing Black uh, Mike Holmes. Do you know who Mike Holmes is? Yeah, the, the uh, Black Mike Holmes yeah. contractor. <laughs> when I told my guys, uh, they, they asked me who is coming. I was Mike Holmes. Oh, Canada, big con uh, construction. Like, no, local Black Mike Holmes. <laughs> That's the first time I got that one. I knocked on people's door before, and I, and I was I handed them my card. Said, "Hey, I'm Mike Holmes." He, they go. Hold up, what'd you say? I said, Mike Holmes. They're like, the contract? Honey, come here. It's Mike Holmes, the contractor. I'm like, uh. <laughs> um, what was your favorite job of all times before even construction, or maybe it was a construction, your favorite job? Oh, before construction, my favorite job? Uh, your first job. My first job was, uh, I was in high school and I was wrestling and I ate a lot of food. And my dad literally put a lock on the refrigerator. <laughs> Cause it, yeah, because it was me, we had two other stepbrothers, and we just eat, 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 eat all the time. How did they put a lock on the refrigerator? Like I didn't know, latch? I didn't know it was possible. There's a refrigerator <laughs> lock. <laughs> it's like a, it's a custom lock, and they had a lock on the refrigerator. And then, so he was like, man, boy, you, you keep eating like that, you're going to get a job, <laughs> you know? And then I remember one day, he goes, he goes, come on, he goes, where are we going? He goes, McDonald's. I'm like, all right, cool. Go get in the car, and we go drive to McDonald's, and he's like, what do you want? I'm like, oh, I get a quarter pounder Happy Meal, or a quarter pounder meal. And then we go sit in the back, and uh, we're eating, and it's me and my dad, and then this guy comes up to me, and they shake hands, and I'm like, who's that? He goes, so this is your son? He goes, yeah. He goes, well, what size shirt is he? He goes, one X. Yeah, he goes, we got a shirt for him. He can start tomorrow. And I'm, I'm eating my sandwich, and I'm like, what just happened? How old were you? I was, uh, that age, I was 15. <laughs> that was my first job. <laughs> How long did it last? Um, I think I was there maybe about a summer, or maybe about a, a summer, and then I switched and went to Walgreens, and then I went to Perkins because it was $2 more, and I worked there. And after that, I jumped into currency, to check cashing stores. And um, I started working for this check cashing store in Minnesota, and it's like a small community of the people that, o that own them. So I was the guy who would bounce around, and they opened up a store in Columbia Heights. Nobody wanted to run it. And I was like, well, I'll go if I can be the manager. And they're like, sure, kid, you're the manager. Like, you just take that drive, and you go there, right? And the, na and the neighborhood, actually, in Columbia Heights was on uh, 41st and Central, and they were really getting robbed a lot. There was a bank across the street that got shut down, a check cashing place that got shut down. There's a lot of places that are getting shut down because they were getting robbed. But I was young, I didn't care, and they had a gun in the store, so I could hold the gun. And I was like, I was like 19, I was like, give me the gun, <laughs> you know? So, and I was always trying to be badass and go walk down the street to the bank, and instead of, I was like, no, we don't need a money truck, I'll go get the money. I was like, just give me the gun, you know? So I was, I was having fun. So that was actually probably one of my favorite jobs, because I got to bounce around the city for six different jobs, six different stores, and I was the one that knew both the systems, and I did that for a few years, and that, that was pretty fun. I enjoyed that a lot. That was probably one of my favorite jobs, wow. check cashing. So your dad really pushed you to get a job? Like everybody works in the family, work ethics have to be there? When you eat that much, you work. <laughs> <laughs> Were you allowed to eat at McDonald's? Yeah, yeah, right. When you worked there? Yeah, when I worked there, yeah. Man, we did everything. McDonald's is just a starter job, you know. You just, we didn't take it seriously. We, you know, you do learn the principles, and McDonald's is good for that. It's a good starter job, but we just had fun. We just, you know. We see somebody we know in drive through we just give them free food and you know, flirt with girls, whatever. It's McDonald's. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, how did you get in construction? Construction was an interesting thing. I, I didn't plan it at all. I was in, I was a mortgage guy for, what, eight years. And then I took off, you know, 2008, eight, nine when everybody did. And then uh, I went back to it uh, just because I knew it and it was comfortable and I could make money and, you know. And then, then I got tired of it, and I was like, this isn't for me. And I was working for a company, and the company, the people that were running the company, got in trouble for this, all the stuff that was going on. And then one day a buddy was like, Mike, go, go pick up the paper. And I look up the paper, and that company was on the front page of the business section. Construction company? No, no, this was mortgage. Mortgage company. And they had gotten in trouble for some mortgage things. And I was like, holy crap, they just asked me to run their office. They got in trouble. I would have been sitting as the manager. I'm like, well, pff, good thing that something told me not to do that, right? It was a buddy of mine actually called me out the blue. So I stayed at home and I just had some money saved up 
And I was just at home, and then uh, I had a buddy we do music with. I, I rap every once in a while, and I write for other artists. And I was writing with this pop guy, and we were making songs together. And then every day he would just like, can I borrow 100 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 200 bucks? And every day he would pay me back. So I was like, what do you do that you pay me back? <laughs> you know? My dad always told me, you borrow somebody money, you don't borrow money that you can't afford to lose. And you know, I just pretty much expected it to be gone. You know, that's your credit. So uh, he borrowed the money, and he kept coming back. And I'm like, what are you, like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I knocked doors for this company, and I just set appointments for this roofing company. It's like hail damage or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay. But by the third or fourth time, one time we're going out on a Friday, and I'm like, well, you go out for three or four hours. You make about $200, $200 $300, dollars $300 sometimes. I was like, let me go with you. He's like, ah, I don't know. I'm kind of the top guy. I hold the record. Got nine appointments in, in three hours. I'm like, whatever, man. Just let me go. He's like, you don't know anything about the industry. I was like, I don't need to. I was like, if you can do it, I can do it. <laughs> so we went out, and it was a St. Paul storm. Of, uh, it was September 21st, uh, 2010, in St. Paul. And then I just hopped out the car. We went door knocking. And then I went out there. We knocked doors. I, I got 11 appointments my first day. I didn't know anything about the industry. I just knew how to get people to say, yeah. And then uh, the guy was like, holy crap, you're good. And I was like, you know, whatever. And then I kept knocking doors, and he was paying me $20 a door, and it was just easy money. It was something to do. Get out for, you know four hours and go make you know whatever and then uh one day you know i speak enough spanish to you know get around get some food we did learn that spanish uh a little bit in school i'm from jersey so like i hear the accent growing up you know but that's like more like puerto rican spanish than like school teaches you like mexican spain and spanish uh so i learned my my, my uh spanish one there and then i worked in the kitchen at perkins so that's when i got to learn some little, you know, <laughs> shit talking, you know, <laughs> you know, so it was fun. But um, I got through the interview just winging. I had the Google, you know, insurance company, you know, and hail and roof, but I got through it. And then I was like, is that all you guys do? And he was like, that's it. Wait for the insurance. I'm like, and I'm sitting here setting appointments for you. You're paying me twenty dollars. I was like, no, I'm a higher caliber than this. <laughs> I was like, that's it. I'm, I'm, do, I'm going to go do my own sales. But it was October, so like in Minnesota, you know, you know, we're here. Yeah. You know, in October, it's pretty much the end of the road. You know, so I went out, and I knew I had to work fast. So I had some female friends, and I got them. I think at the time they, were, I was getting paid ten percent. So I told her, I said, whatever appointments you help set me. I'll give you, you know, I made up, hey, I'll give you, you know, a certain amount of cash and a couple percentage on deals. And then I taught her to build a team under her. So she brought all her girls out. And I'd show up usually in a car. It would be me and three girls. And then I'd get out and I'd put two girls on one street and me and her be on the other street. And we'd knock until they get an appointment. And I'd do inspections and they just keep going. And, wow. and in a month. And you were like brand new. Yeah. And yeah, in a month, I had 88 people by the end of the month, 88 clients by the end of the month. And then the snow. That's signed contracts? Yeah. The people that are work clients, uh, signed contracts. Some of them, were, you know, not all of them were signed. About 50 something were signed. But leads and working with wow. just like quick coming out. And, um, but they were all people that were yeses. Was it your company or still no, work for someone? I was working for my buddy Thad at the time. Because I, um, I, I, I had researched different companies. And um, a friend of mine who was dating my roommate at the time, her dad owns one of the biggest ones here, Sella. Sure. And I was like, well, I can go for them, but they're too, too big. It's too big to go to. You know, there's no opportunity at big companies. I learned that at the check cashing store. I'm always going to work small companies. Because when you work at a small company, my attitude was, you know, if you work at a company like Best Buy, you're, it, what does it take to get to the top, right? You're never going to see the top, really. But in a small company, the opportunity is there. Right. If I can see the boss and touch the boss, that means I can be the boss. So if I, want to, if I look for a company and I know I can see and I can touch the boss, then, and we're eating lunch every day, that means I can do what you can do. I can get it. So I, I learned that I never wanted to work for a large corporation, and I was always going to stay in a small company, a small business. And then so, so they were too big, and it was another company, and then this one, Repair King. And um, Repair King was small enough, but the name sounded catchy, and I just seen uh, I just seen the opportunity. And the guy Thad, my buddy Thad Ben Benick, who has the company, um, he had a reputation. And whenever I'd interview, I'd say, Hey, what do you know about this company, that company? They go, Oh, Thad. They go, Thad pays. Thad pays. And I was like, Why do you say Thad? And I went to him. I said, Everybody says Thad pays. I'm like, Why do? You, what does that mean? He goes, Well, Mike, what you're going to find out in this industry is a lot of contractors don't pay. <laughs> he goes, He pays. So I was like, Well, I can deal with a lot of stuff, but I can't deal with not getting paid, right? So I just, so I went there, and I saw the opportunity, and uh, I was kind of back and forth with him for a while. I was with him, and then when the winter time hit, after I got this large amount of people that I'm about to deal. I'm counting my deals. In my head, I'm thinking $1,000 a contract, easy. So I'm like, $88,000, let us go. And then the snow hit. I don't know if you remember the, the snowstorm 2010. It was like yeah. massive snow. 
and I'm sitting there stuck with these contracts. I'm like, well, what do we do now? He's like, I'm going to Florida. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, what happens? You know, what about my contracts? He's like, hold on. So I had a buddy who was like, hey, you come to Colorado. He found out what I was doing and he tried to snatch me. He was like, you come to Colorado, I'll teach you how to run the company in Colorado and then you can go back and do it in Minnesota. And then it was cool, but he was a real rockhead. And so we split and then I went back to Thad and at Repair King. So you sales rep or it's your company? Now it's my company. It's yeah. your company, your owner or? Yeah, owner, yeah. 100%? Yeah, 100%. So you bought but, it out? Yeah, it, it, was, it, was a, um, it was a transition. He kind of, Thad's a, he's a real good dude, but he just uh, fell into just a, a bad situation. And one of the things that, that damages small companies in this industry is people, you know for sure, but like um, you end up being, a ban you end up being uh, the sales, you end up being admin, construction, production, and also the part that they don't see is the finance. So our situation that was hurting us at that time was, you know, just to make an example, say you get $50,000 contract, uh, when you get the $50,000 contract, you know, the insurance company might give you whatever, say twenty five dollars for half, for easy. They'll give you 25000 Then when you get that 25000 you give it to the bank, and the bank can do whatever. They can hold the money. They can sign off. They can release it. We were getting a lot of banks that would only release one-third of whatever amount they released. So they get a $25,000 check. What is that, like $8,500 or something? They're starving you. Yeah, they're starving you. And then, so, and then they take long to pay and release the depreciation. Well, we got so many deals that he had to borrow money, and then it just got that kind of yeah, thing. a financial mess? Yeah, it's a financial mess. Did he have to close it? or? Well, he was looking at selling it because one day I went there, and he's like, I found these real, really profitable deals, really good, these uh, asbestos houses, and I found out a way to get asbestos paid for, and I, I met, kind of made a killing. And he was, one day he was like, Mike, I can't pay you. And I'm like, hmm? what do you mean? Huh? We, uh, that pays? <laughs> yeah. you know, but he was a, he's a really good dude, and, he, and it wasn't a trust factor at all. You know, and these were open books, and, you know, and he's like, oh, I've got to sell the company. He's like, this is what happens. This is real life. And I'm like, you know, I get it. You know, he showed it to me, explained it to me, and I get it. So he was going to sell the company, and then he's like, Mike, why don't, why don't you just do it? He's like, if anybody deserves it, it's you. He's like, why don't you do it? And I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I don't really, I'm not a contractor. I don't know anything about contract. I can sell, but I don't know construction. So he's like, just take the test. And then so I, I took the test, and I passed, and that's been that. When, when did that took place? Uh, 2015 is when I took over. So you've been running your business for the last five years. Yeah, he's definitely been helping me. He's a major help. He's, he runs all the production. He runs the backside. He's, so he works for you now? He works with me, yeah. He's a good, he's a great guy, good asset, buddy, so friend. Describe life of salesperson versus life of business owner. To someone out there who may be selling now and want to run a business, they're like, I'm going to do it all. I don't Go need sell. a boss. Go sell. <laughs> so here's the easy way. Here's the easy um Here's an easy metaphor. If we're in a boat fishing, you can throw your fish in the line and you can catch your fish and throw it there. And then you just pass it to somebody else and they handle it. That's a sales guy. And you still eat and you still get a good portion. If you're the business owner, you got to pay for the boat. <laughs> you got to pay for the bait, the license, the permit. You got to check the weather. You got to put the life vest on. You got to make sure nobody drowns, a safety vest. You got to make sure they're not drunk on your boat. When you go there, you got to make sure the limit, the size of the fish are bad. You know, you got to do everything. Then when you catch the fish, you got to throw the, take the fish. You got to make sure it doesn't die because then the fishing was for nothing if the fish dies. You got to cut it, cook it, fillet it, take it to the kitchen, do the dishes. <laughs> Just, just catch the fish and move on. <laughs> so, I mean, it, 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 there's, there's definitely benefits to being an owner, I mean. My name is Dmitry and I approved this message. It's pretty accurate. It's pretty good, good presentation. It was good. <laughs> right. But, you know, there's definitely benefits to being an owner. To, uh, to me, I, I explain to a lot of my friends. I say, because, for example, think about this. When we get a big storm, we get people that come from out of state, right? So that's what I use for an example when I show the people that work with me. I'm like, yeah, it sounds good being an owner. But I'm like, do you notice that when the other owners come here, only some of them try to open up a set or do their own office. The smart ones, they pick a company, throw the shirt on, make the sales, and get out. And that's, and that's to me, that's admirable. Because my old boss, Jim Gibbs, used to tell me, you know, he says, you know, you can make more money. You can, he's like, Mike, you can make more money than me being a sales guy. You know, and I didn't understand so it. So true. Right? So um, as a sales guy, oh, what, what I explained to them, I say, uh, you know, as the owner, you have all these responsibilities. Um, as a sales guy, you can come in and just sell and produce without the liability. You can go to bed when you want to. You can go to sleep. Me, I have to, 
You get then you got to do daycare and talk to the sales. It just never ends. So there's it, there, there's good. But I tell my friends, I say the real benefit is when I get my deal, I keep all the money. So I make the most money. You know, as a, as an owner, you make the most money selling your own deals. You make less money because you're giving time and the lost opportunity of not selling when you're helping somebody else. So there has to be this number of. You have to get the right number of sales guys for it to make sense. It can't be too little and too much can be too much liability. Sure. So we established that sales guys can make more than owners. Easy. Can uh, crew leaders or someone who just uh, on the labor side run the crew business, subcontracting business make more than owner or more than sales rep? I think if How they... much money is in the industry altogether? Have you seen guys who run crews make real money? I have. And... You know, everything's a hustle, right? You pick mm -hmm. your hustle and you find your niche. It's, you know, you could be in a restaurant. You could say, oh, I want to be the guy that sells the steaks or the liquor. Well, the guy who's selling the fork is doing pretty good, too. Mm -hmm. So you pick a, you pick an area, and as long as it's a part of that machine, it's a necessary part. If it's necessary, then there's supply and demand. You know, the, the demand is there. So if everybody wants to be a roofing, a roofing contractor owner, well, somebody has to manage the crews. I've seen people manage the crews themselves. And I think if I, like, say if I were to ever do that, I could make good money, but then you have to just go get more guys, more guys. You know, I got a buddy who just went down to the Louisiana storm who just came down here and he's owned his own company. He went down there to go manage subs because when you go there, a lot of people guys get the low hanging fruit first. They tarp mm -hmm. and then they figure out what the low hanging fruit so they can make a living, get established and then go get the deals. And he ended up opening a gutter company. And he's like, Mike, I'm making, uh, he said, I started off making $1,000 a day. Now I'm making $3,000 a day. Now I got three trucks, uh, three more trucks. It's about to be $9,000 a day. And he's making a killing just doing gutters. And Love it. it totally wasn't the plan. Love it. You know? I mean, that, that's where demand is. And demand for crews is huge. Nobody wants to do it, but there's a lot of money in it. Yeah. Just a lot of people argue, or I see on the YouTube channel that we run, a lot of hate. People say, well, you're just a sales rep or you're just the owner. And there's no money in labor. I'm like, you kidding me? There's so much. Like, I know how much I pay. You know, I can teach Saab how to make real good money. And at the end of the day, everybody has opportunities. And for me, that's easy. That's bulletproof. Like, you get paid for labor. You don't deal with materials. There's no risk. I mean, every once in a while, crews don't get paid. But you can chase. You can lean the houses, whatever. Yeah. You can definitely make money. And just people don't see it that way. Gr uh, grass is always greener somewhere else. Yeah. You know, let them know. Hey, if you don't think it's green, you know, my thing is, hey, if you don't think there's money in here, go do something else. Let me do it. I'll take care of it. My my mentor um, came up with uh, Rodney Webb. Okay. He, um, I don't know if you know of him, but he's a big black that, guy. Is that the Owens Corning guy? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, he works for Owens Corning. So he's from Atlanta. Okay. And back in the day, he was, he started working... <clears throat> In the, um, for window company and start door knocking. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, his story is like, he came up with a system because he got a lot of rejections. Being a black guy, you know, people don't want to trust you. I want to hear about that. Do you, how do you overcome objections? And do you feel like it's a little bit harder for you uh, on a trust level side uh, or? As an individual, as a black guy, as yes, a what? Yes, as Every, a black, yeah. It's just, I'll say it. I don't know. Yep, yep, you yep, introduced yep. me as Black Mike. This is Black Mike Holmes. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> so spit it out. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't care. Um, you know what I do? I have a gimmick. Everybody has a sales gimmick, and I tell people straight up to their face. I say I have a sales gimmick. You know what it is? I go what? I go. I tell the truth. And if you like me, you like me. If you don't, you don't. But you're going to respect me. They love the honesty. It's raw. Sometimes I kind of got you know make sure you know you got to keep it where it needs to be so you don't, but people love it. People love the truth. They love, no, because the tr if I give you the truth, whether you like it or not, you know I could, you know you can trust me. You know I'm honest. You, you know, hey, this guy's gonna tell it like it is. So that's my gimmick. If I'm with somebody, they give me an objection. If I know the answer, I tell them the answer. If I don't, I say I'll figure it out, or I talk to you, or I don't, or I don't know what it is. But you're gonna get an honest guy. And I am just really thorough at selling myself. And I just be who I am. Because it doesn't matter the shirt. It, I tell them it doesn't matter the shirt. It doesn't matter the logo. You're dealing with me. Are you going to want to work with me? And then I tell them why they may want to work with me. And when I deal with objections, I just take the objection and I just talk about it honestly. And I think my honesty, bluntness, transparency, listening skills, being able to translate what they need to hear really helps. And I've been told a lot that I, I don't hear no well. <laughs> so sometimes it's good, sometimes it's annoying. But to me... This industry is great for me, for a person like me, for us guys out there who don't 
hear no too well. When I hear no, and if I know, and if I know or feel in my mind, if I know or feel that I'm accurate, and I said something to you, I presented something to you, and I say no, if I say, Dimitri, do you want this coffee? And you're like, no. I'm like, mm, you want it. I just haven't said it in the right way that you understand that you want it, because I know that you want this coffee before for these reasons. And if I'm not giving it to you right, no, it's not no. It's just you haven't heard it in the way that you needed to hear it. So I need to learn your language and speak to you in your language. You know? Well, not not many people can do that. Can you give one advice to someone who is? A little bit more shy than yourself, the very shy person who wants to get in sales, wants to get in the roofing, and just man, I because I have a lot of students yeah. who who are not you. They're just not proactive. They're not. They hear no really well. Yeah. And they're like, if it's no, okay, bye, thank you, sorry to bothering you. Give them advice. Yeah, my, my buddy Fad's like that. He goes out if he knocks the doors. He hears no twice. The day is over. He's he'll, he's leave. He's like, up. Oh, I'm going to the bar. <laughs> I'm like, what happened? It's a it's a fresh storm. He's like, oh, no, I'm just I'm, I'm I've dealt with this already. I don't want to hear it. And I'm just like, so so no affects people differently. You know, you, you take it like if you're at a bar and you're talking to a girl and she says no. You say, hey, sweetie, you know, yada yada. Do you want to talk to me? This and that. Whatever you say to a girl and she goes no. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. First of all, you spent an hour getting ready. You got your hair done, your nails done, your makeup done, you picked your dress, you laid it out. I know how much time you put into being presentable. You want attention. Let's just get you the right attention. So it, it's, it's, you, you want it. So if it, if it didn't come, it's just not, it wasn't presented in the way that you were looking for it. So let's figure out how you like it. And it's the same thing, you know what I'm saying? So when it comes down to sales, if somebody's shy, I, try, I had this guy from, north, from this small town in North Dakota, and he was, he was horrible. <laughs> Um, as sales, but he was driven, and you couldn't ignore his drive, even though he was such a dry personality. He was looked like an accountant from a back library closet, and I just told him his name was Ty, and I was like, Ty, just be yourself, man. I was like, just understand, people are human, and I said, God put somebody here for all of us. The, you can see the fattest, ugliest, or best-looking girl or guys. It doesn't matter who they are. They have kids, don't they? Yeah, well, that means there's somebody for them. Ty, you're weird, but there's somebody for you. There's going to be somebody that hates me because I'm too much, I'm too outspoken, I'm too urban or too black or too tall or talk too fast. or They just don't want to deal with me because I remind them of something. But they're going to see you and they're going to love you. And I taught him to feel confident in himself and go find his match. I was like, if you knock enough doors, you're going to find your match. You're going to find somebody who's been waiting to talk to you. And he did excellent. And he had some of the weirdest customers, but they like loved him. And they're like, oh, he's great. And I said, just be honest, just tell the truth. Don't let the word no bother you because people are going to reject you before they even know what you're wanting. You ever pick up the phone, Bring. no. It happens, right? You knock on the door, you ever knock, they knock on somebody's door. I had this one lady one time, she was went through the blinds and she's like chewing her gum. She's like, and I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I was just like, I just make them laugh. When I get uncomfortable, I just do something I make them laugh. So when I get uncomfortable, I get nervous energy, and I just turn it into laughter. And I figure out, I just try to find how can we level, like where do we level at? Which, how can we tune into each other's frequencies? And once we're on that frequency, then I can talk to you. Then I'm there. So I think if you find, as long as you're honest with yourself, you always remain yourself and remain within who you are. Don't step outside yourself because people spot that in a half a second. Mm -hmm. Then you're being fake. Once you're being fake, now they don't like you. Now you're guarded. You messed up. So always be honest. If you mess up, say I messed up. I, uh, 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 you know what? I hate giving scripts. You know what? You ever do that? You ever mess up? You know, so I would do that on the phones or in person lots of times. Uh, somebody would give you a script and I read the script. Hey, my name is Mike and I'm here to tell you. A um, I hate scripts. You hate scripts? Yeah, boom. And now we connected. Now I can talk to you. So I find the first way that we can connect with each other, if it's the fact that you hate somebody talking to you, reading the script, now we just relate it. Hey, we're best friends. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you know? Wow. Man, I know. I'll, I would buy from you. That's for sure. <laughs> I want to hear one crazy story from the homeowner. From the homeowner? Like, uh, give me a story where it started with a big rejection, but then you sold them after the fact. God, I got many. I'm going to give you a black one since you did the black thing. <laughs> The first of the couple. <laughs> What's the black thing? <laughs> it's just a black bike, the black set, but it's real, right? So, so we're in Minnesota, it's real, and, and somebody, many people relate to that. It doesn't matter whether you're black, and the whole black thing doesn't matter because, I mean, like my dad told me, if there was no black folks, they would hate redheads or freckles. People are gonna hate people, they're gonna pick a subcategory, or whatever. Russians. Russians, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so. Um, it's funny because I have this thing with accents, right? So, whenever I hear an accent in my head, like, so remember, so this is the psychology of my brain, right? I'm always trying to find, remember I said I'm trying to find the frequencies? So when I hear an accent, 
somewhere in my mind, I adapt to that frequency. So I was at Dimitri's seminar the other day, and we were ta- I was taking notes. I started taking notes in your accent. <laughs> I was like, and get to the roof, and the, you know, and like talk in front of crowd. I was like, no, it's talk in front of the crowd. And I, I, I hear a lot, a lot of people commenting uh, on my Facebook post. They say we always read your quote in your accent. In your <laughs> accent, yeah, yeah, right. It was like, yeah, the Russian accent. Everything sounds tough. So, it's what, what's, what's the black thing? That you the black read? thing was, um, so I, I always get the black stuff, right? You know, what I found was. They either love you, hate you, or they're curious. You know, I went to this high school, Lakeville here. My first day of school, they said nigger. They wrote "Go home, niggers" on the front door, and I was like, "Huh? Oh, here we go." <laughs> you know, it was funny because I didn't know what the Confederate flag was. And in high school, I'm from Jersey. I didn't know what the Confederate flag was. So my dad's like, "Hey, how do you like school here?" I'm like, "Oh, it's cool." I'm like, "There's a lot of Dukes or Hazard fans here." He was like, "What do you mean?" I was like, "You know that blue X on top of that orange car?" He's like, "You mean the Confederate flag, the General Lee?" I'm like, "I don't know the blue X." He's like, "Yeah." I'm like, that thing is everywhere in that school. They got hats, bumper stickers, cars, shirts. I mean, like, he's like, really? I was like, yeah. So, like, we ended up being on, on TV, uh, court TV. I met Johnny Cochran. We were on the news, all kind of stuff. Like, oh, wow. There's a lot of activity in there. Um, but they were scared. To, you know, they wouldn't, whatever. But so um, what I realized was it was just lack, lack of exposure. So if I never met a Russian, you represent Russians to me. Mm-hmm. So if I never, you never met a black guy, except for on TV, you know, most people's perception is whatever they see on media, and it's always a certain so stereotype, true. right? So like people always think, oh, Russians, tough, crazy, wrestling, fighting, fighting bears, you know, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. But it's really like, ah, oh, that's, that's not my uncle's not like that, but my other uncle is, you know. <laughs> but so the black thing, I have to overcome a lot of objections, and then so. My buddy Thad always laughs because he's like, Mike, you do well in small towns, USA, places that I'm scared to go to, you kill it in because I do well in uncomfortable situations because then I, it just forces me to go through it. It's like when you know when they say when you're going through something, don't stop, go through it. So I get in an uncomfortable spot and I just keep going instead of I don't know how to go backwards. So I go to some of these small towns and I knock on doors. And what this lady did? This, this, this one was, I had a relationship when I went down there. It was Blue Earth. Blue Earth got hit with hail. When I went down there, I had a relationship. So I called him. I told him I was Is coming. Is it Minnesota? Minnesota. South Minnesota. And um, about an hour north of Iowa. And so when I went down there, there was I, I said, hey, I'm coming down there. I have a list ready when I get there of your clients. And I got there, and I had a list of these clients. So every day, I'd knock out the list of his clients. I didn't have to door knock. One of the guys was another construction guy. So I'm like, they're like, oh, how are you going to do that? I was like, some of my clients are construction. I was like, construction... There's different kinds of construction. His, his person told me to go talk to him. I'm going to go talk to him. So I go talk to the guy. I pull up. He's a construction guy. And he, we're out on a farm. And I mean, like, cows. And it smells like everything. It's the worst smells. Just everything. So we get there. And it's like king of the hill. You know, these guys, I pull up. And the guys are leaning on the back of a pickup, pickup truck. And they're sitting there chewing on a straw, literally. The one guy's cutting up hot dogs, putting poison inside the hot dogs for, for raccoons. And they, yeah, they're like, I'm like, they're putting these little blue pills in the, in the cut up hot dogs. And they're sitting there. And they all got on their flannel shirts. And, they, and I come up and they look at me. And they, none of them say anything. I'm like, oh, shit, here we go. You know? And I got my buddy with me. He's native. And he's bigger than me. Um, and I already warned him before we got there. You know, I, we, we talk about these things. And we got there, and we were cool. The guy was really reserved. I told him who sent me, so he, he relaxed. I said, hey, I'm going to go check things out. So I was like, let's just go walk around, do the inspection, let those guys talk and get that off the way. We go walk around. We find the damage. We come back. We talk to him. And then he was like, you know, you're the first black person to be on my property in a long time. And I was like, well, how? I was like, I was like, well, how? I was like, oh yeah. He's like, yeah. I was like, what was the? La-? I was like, I didn't want to ask with the last guy because it was going to go somewhere. I already knew it. So I was like, well, I forgot what I said. I said something slick to him. So usually with people, I throw back comedy with them. And we went back and forth, and we made a couple of jokes. My buddy knew a couple of jokes too, so we got him laughing. He was like, you know what, you fellas, are all right. He's like, go and grab a beer. So I'm like, all right. So we grabbed a beer and started drinking. And then we talked. We did the inspection. He wanted, he had to be reserved and be the tough guy. Later, we ended up leaving. Everything was cool. He told us to come back later when the adjuster was there. Um, I call. It was an insurance agent. I called the insurance agent. He's like, did you go to, I'm not going to say his name, but he's like, did you go to such and such house? I'm like, yeah. He was like, how how, how did everything go? I'm like, it was cool. I'm like, he was a little weird at first. I could tell he didn't know how to act, but he, and he wanted to be the tough guy or whatever. But you know, I know how to deal with people, so he's cool. He, he invited us back. 
He goes, there was no problems or nothing? He didn't say any, you know, he says crazy things. I was like, what, you mean, did he call me a nigger? He was like, yeah. I was like, do you think he's going to look me in my face and call me a nigger? Like, do you think he's going to do that? He was like, well, he called the office and he said, and he said, well, who's that? He said, uh, why'd you send some nigger and some spick out here? <laughs> and I was like, he said that? He was like, yeah. I was like, dude, in my face, he was laughing. We were making jokes. He gave me a beer. He invited me back. He showed me, like, when we, I went in his house. His wife showed me around. I'm like, do you see this stuff? I'm like, in my face, they're this, but behind my back, they're like that. He's like, yeah, well, he's just talking that. You know, he just has to be the eccentric guy. And then so I'm like, well, in my head, I'm like, I'm going to take your money. And I'm, I'm going to go get the deal and get the money. The adjuster comes, and I got to know the adjuster because I had all the clients from the same person. The adjuster told me how crazy the guy was, and he chased him off his property because the guy wouldn't take the cosmetic damage. So the guy went in his house and pulled out a shotgun and told the adjuster, he said, get, you get the hell off my property right now. And then he said, you back up. You don't turn around. You black back straight up. So then the adjuster was like, what? He was like, what are you doing? So he went and hopped in his car and he started to do like a three point turn. He says, no, you just back clear up. And he made the adjuster back, walk, drive backwards <laughs> down his thing. And he was just so eccentric. At the end of the day, he was really cool. He ended up being really nice with us. I told him that what he, what I heard, what I heard him said. And I was like, yeah, the, your insurance agent told me what you said. He's like, well, that's just how we are down here, Mike. You know, you're different. You're cool. Don't mean nothing by it. He says, but the last person that was on my property was hanging from a tree. <laughs> this is real. This is a real shit. <laughs> this is real. And he was like, I'm like, man. But he's like, why don't you come back out? He says, we're having, you know what? First of all, you go down to the butcher and go get yourself a, a thick one inch cut of ribeye off my cow I just got up. And then, you know, you come back September. We're going to have a, uh, we're going to fry up a half, we're going to cook up a half a cow. It's going to be me, about a hundred of my friends. And we're going to be out here and we're going to drown. No, I'm not coming to a hundred, y'all. <laughs> Um, it's okay. I go to McDonald's, you know. But I overcame, you know, him dealing with him. This is it, that was an eccentric one. But I get a lot of people that are judgmental. And the black thing in Minnesota is like, you know, I remember also my dad told me he works in the casino industry and down in Alabama. He was telling me he was like, Mike, you know the difference between the north and the south. He was like, in the south, if they don't like you, they're gonna be like, you know, nigger, I don't like you. Get off my porch or get out of here. Mm -hmm. He goes in Minnesota, you just wonder why you didn't get the job. And th that. Always That's the stuck, worst. Always stuck with me. Because you know how many times I wonder why I didn't get the job? I was first. I was best. Had the better service. Got it paid for. And I know people got a lot of those stories. But it, hap you, it happens a you lot. You just don't know. Yeah, you just don't know. And I got, you know, I told a story at dinner time too. And I see, you know, a lot of things happen. But for me, I brush it off. I keep going. I don't get offended. There's nothing somebody says that really offends me. Because you offend me. It's, you know, if somebody calls your name, it's, you're trying to offend me. But most people, when they meet me, they like me. And I just know that you don't have exposure. So I'm looking at them like they're handicapped. I'm like, oh, they're handicapped. They don't have any exposure. They don't have any knowledge. They're not smart. They're not intelligent. That's why you think the way you do. Because one beautiful thing about this industry is it gives you broad experience. You can go and meet we me. We might who, I, we might have never met. You're going to meet somebody rich, poor, white, black. And you know whites have white trash. Blacks have ghetto. Everybody has their different. It's not color. It's class. And you in this industry, one of the beautiful things is, the be, one of the things I love about this industry the most is the people. You get to meet the people. And you get, and the people, the stories of the people that I meet, mm -hmm. that's my real joy in this industry. First, it was the money. But then you realize, hey, I'm really helping people. And it sounds kind of corny, but you're almost like a philanthropist sometimes. When you meet a customer that's really in trouble and been denied or they're coming to you crying and you realize that you can help somebody, that's the, that's the really dope thing about this industry. How do you teach that? That's very inspiring. How do you teach that? Because I see so many sales guys get <clears throat> burned out. They, they'll do it for one, two, three, four years. They burn out. They just... Uh, they reach point, it's almost like a shelf life. Yeah. After like four or five years, I see so many guys, they're tired of denials, they're tired of traveling. You have amazing attitude towards it, but how do you teach it? Like, let's say you're around five guys. I mean, you've probably seen your guys here in like two no's. Okay, I'm on the bar. Yeah. How do you teach that? Like that, hey guys, no is no, it's okay. Like just uh, brush it off. I can't brush it off. You know, it's the, the person offended me. Like yeah. They, they want to fight. They want to argue. They want to, you know, it affects them mentally. Right. Do you have um, training tips? You, my best thing is real life experience. And a lot of guys, I'm sure a lot of guys will tell you, just hop, just hop in the car and come with me. And I like a lot of really one-on-one -on -one personal advice. I can sit at a conference table and we can talk. I find myself when I'm talking to guys and I'm training guys, I'm kind of a broad-minded person. It's never about what we're talking about. It's about the equation in life of how to solve 
problems and how to deal with life. So if somebody's losing their love for something, you have to find something to love. If you look at your wife, your girlfriend, husband, whatever you got, um, and you lose the spark, you've, you've, you've lost sight of, of what you should be loving or appreciating. Mm -hmm. And you have to revamp that. And you have to say, I have to find something to love in this. This coffee, whatever it is, whatever, you know, it, 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 sure. you have to find something to love. So in this industry, sometimes people will go, oh, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of hearing no's. And they get really pessimistic and that, that infectious mind disease of being pessimistic gets in them. And then it's just like, once you have that, then you're having a bad day. And we know a lot of things are mental. You, you lose here, you lose everywhere. You win here, you win everywhere. So when you find the art and the beauty in everything, and you, and it sounds corny, but this is really how I think. But then when you, when you find the beauty in it, the beauty is poetic. And when you, and when you find that art and that love in it, then you begin, you always will love it. You'll always love the person you're with. You'll always appreciate it. You'll always love your industry. You're going to love who you are and what you do. So if you get annoyed with one section, find a different branch on a tree and find something to love. You're getting tired of the no's. Think about the yeses. You get tired of the frustration. One day I was having a bad day and it was just like everything was going terrible. Crew, people, lose jobs, you know, whatever. Everything was bad. And I was just having, I got, found myself getting really pessimistic. And I was like, F this, forget that. Turn on my music. I don't care. I'm going home, whatever. And then I called one of my boys in, in Denver and I was, I was like, you know what, man? I was like, man, I'm having a bad day. Annoying. He's like, Mike, He's like, you're the one that always gets me out of the rut and everything. He was like, Mike, how many bad days did you have this month? I was like, I don't know. It's like the end of the month. I'm like, I don't know, maybe two, three. I don't know. He's like, Mike, there's people that have bad days every day. There's people that have three or four bad days a week. He wow. goes, you have three or four bad days a month. What are you crying? I was like, yeah. and I was out of it just like that. And I was like, you know what? I'll take it. I'll take this job. I'll take the money. I can leave when I want. I can come when I want, you know. As a salesperson, <laughs> you know, and I had to think about the benefits. And I had to think, do I want this life or do I want that life? That whole grass is always greener. No, the grass is greener where you water it. The grass isn't greener on the other side. If you're looking over there, this water's dying, you know, so it, the grass is greener where you water it. You got to find a way to love what you do. And if it means this industry, because it's a, these are all life lessons, it has nothing to do with roofing specific. Just love who you are and love what you do and appreciate it and find the love in it. And then you'll, you'll always be happy with it. Name of a business is uh, Repair King. Repair King. Two questions here. Okay. Number one is, are you a repair company? Number two, what's up with the Kings? Man, uh, so it, it, I walked into it. So Thad started the company in Florida, and he came in after a hurricane, and he was telling the story that everybody wants to do the big jobs, nobody wants to do the small stuff. So he made a name for himself, literally, Repair King. Uh, going around repairing tile, one tile, two tile, three tile. So that's what, that's the origination of it. Then he brought it back to Minnesota because he liked the name. And, um, this is the newer logo. The, the, the previous one was an R and a K with like, I this, remember that one. Yeah, it was ugly. It was scary. Nobody knew what it was. And it looked, it was supposed to be a screwdriver with a crown on top. It looked like a trash can on fire and it was just horrible. This logo could use some work too. Man, leave my I logo alone now. <laughs> but like we had the, um, it, it was a lot. I mean, so think about that. To go from, now, now if you even Google any go uh, logo changes, I was just talking about this with somebody the other day. And uh, we were in the Mall of America. When you go down the escalators, lo Lego shows you their transitions. And if you watch any logo transitions, it's usually a gradual transition. So to go from that RK to this, it took me a long time to be to do that. It was kind of a really... Uh, just don't stop there. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Keep going. You don't like it, man. Hey, Max, what do you think about his logo? I like it. It's good. He don't want to say it. <laughs> so for me, what I think was, people were calling us RK Roofing, RK Construct. They never get the name right. Repair King Construction. And I was just tired of it. People were calling us, oh, can you repair my uh, toaster and this? And I'm like... We, uh, it's roofs. So I had to change it. And I wanted to make a logo that was more simple, that was more modern. And well, why don't you add the roofing to your name? Um, you know, I've thought about that. Um, I didn't want to do... The, the, the transition was, do I just do something totally different? Because you could do that because people, they don't know. You know, people see, they're like, oh, yeah, we heard about you guys. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> you know, but thanks. Yeah, sure. Choose us, not the other guys. Um, you know, so people, they think they know it. So they think they knew the logo, and I was really nervous about not making a gradual change because people know RK. And then I just got totally got rid of the RK, and I said, I'll keep the Repair King, but I made the crown because of the king, and I put the house in it. Because everybody does that roof line thing, and that, that's just played out to me. It's like, every, everybody does that. So do you do a lot of repairs? We get calls for repairs, 
and we hope they turn into roofs. <laughs> so we do get repairs. And actually recently we've got a really solid, we've been through some handyman repair guys. We've got a really solid guy and I just give them all to him and because, you know, something's going to be small, something's going to be big. We would be selective and if we had the time to do it, we'd do it. But usually somebody, if they call you for a one missing shingle or, or a small leak, you know, you're crossing your fingers hoping that it turns into a roof replacement and they got hail damage. So, you know. Last question about King. Jordan or LeBron? Instinctually, they're just two different eras. So instinctually Jordan, but the updated version is LeBron. That's the simple answer, right? All right, political correct. I went through your website and you have the question, why us? Yeah. Actually in several um, sections of the website, okay. but there's no story. You can't click on it. There's no stories I have to ask. No, tell why me. would I hire you? Why would you hire me? You would hire me because you're going to like me. You can trust me. I'm going to service you. I enjoy what I do with a passion. And there's so many. And, and my thing is I'm going, to pro, I'm going to protect you from all the bad stories. You know, they've, well, a lot of homeowners, they hear all the bad stories. Half a roof, bad guy, walked away, this and that. You're not going to get that with us. We, or we hope not. And if something does go wrong, we're going to be there. We're going to answer the phones. We're going to fix it. You know, it's like the warranty. You know, you're as good as your the car is as good as the warranty. You know, we're going to follow through. We've had so many scenarios in our industry where we fix stuff that wasn't our fault. You know, it was the we, we, we take care of our customers. And that's what it really comes down to, that we really care about our customers and we're really going to be there. Um, you know, you can, everybody can give you all the fancy schmancy, well, we have this and we do that. Listen, I'm a real guy. You're a real guy. I'm going to take care of you. Let me show you how, let me show you why. Let me walk through it. And I just really sell the people, the people aspect and the service aspect of it. And the fact that I love what I do. If you don't like what you want to do, who do you want to cook for you? The guy who loves the cook or the guy who's waiting to get off at three o'clock and doesn't really like you. I love what I do. I'm good at it. I know a lot of the things I need to protect you from, and I'm going to make your experience good and I'm going to make some money and you're going to get a new roof. I have one comment. I published your video uh, a couple of days ago. You reviewing a shingle, oh, yeah. and we already have comment. I want you to publicly answer to that comment. I will. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is your video. Yeah. Here's the comments. I want you to read this comment. The longest, uh, the biggest comment there. Okay. Read it out loud. All right. Pierogio uh, guy, whatever. Here, do me a favor. Read for, I wear I'm reading glasses. So okay, I got sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. Brother got reading glasses. So yeah. good roofers can control their gun and hit that line no problem. And shingles come back to back so the tar doesn't stick to the granule side. Never trust the salesman. Trust, trust my, uh, that's my review. Never trust the salesman. Shut up. <laughs> that's my first answer. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, somebody's always got something to say, man. Just shut up, man. Welcome to my world. I get this stuff every day. Like, oh, you just run a business. You just, you're not a roofer. Well, I run a business. I don't have to roof because, you know, I have my job. Yeah. It's just like, you just, you got to find something to argue about. Never Listen, trust the salesman. The first of all, salesmen run businesses. Everybody needs a salesperson. Salespersons are the reason why companies can thrive. They're the boots on the ground. They're the they're everything. If there's no sales, there's no company. And most and almost every company, I don't care what you do, pick an industry. You need sales guys. And yeah, and the guys who install need it. Like I agree. Yeah, with that's like a girl saying, "Never trust a man." Uh, you need one if you want to reproduce. Okay, <laughs> so you better figure it out and find one you can trust. Um, so you, they'll take your bad experience and turn that into our situation and try to say, "Never trust a salesman." I don't trust somebody who tells somebody. Not to trust somebody you got uh, old issues that you haven't dealt with you got animosity and you're holding on to stuff and when you speak that way i know that you got so much stuff going on psychologically i just don't even want to deal with you so how can you tell somebody to trust somebody that if you don't even know them you don't know their intent what they're going on you just say you're a sales guy so you're a bad guy come on man get out of here man like i can tell you got a bad marriage and your kids don't like you and your friends are annoyed with you and they never tell you why they really don't like you so like just be quiet your wife probably left a couple of years yeah ago. a couple of years and you won't stop looking at her facebook and you got fake just leave it come on man don't trust sales guys listen we're telling the truth you find a, tr a sales guy that's honest and that can trans translate what's going on. We're just representatives. Sales is really just, I mean, you go to college, it's called political, was it called poli science, political science, and they're, they're teaching sales. I mean, every everything is sales. Sales runs the world, and that's just the way it is. So learn sales. Sales is a blend of psychology, communication, translating things, dealing with people, people skills. You, they should teach sales in school, honestly, because if people they don't, should. right? If people don't have sales, 
That's why we have the introverts, because they were never taught how to interact with people. You, you go to school, you learn arithmetic, science, reading, whatever, but you don't deal how to, you, there's so much you don't learn in school. Um, and to answer this guy with the shingles, listen, you don't run, I don't know you don't run a crew. I'm going to assume you don't run a crew because if you did, you would know the st- the guys aren't going to sit there and slowly do this and be accurate. And that's why white crews are slower than the Mexican crews because your guys are sitting there probably doing this. I'm going to guess the guy's white. I haven't seen it, but I'm just in my mind, he's white. Okay. So, <laughs> so, and they're sitting there doing this and most guys, they just want to boom, do boom. They're trying to get through it. It's time, time is money. So, Yes, you can sit there and nail perfectly on the line, but time is money, and that costs a lot but of nobody time. Nobody can. No, nobody can because you're tired, you'd angle, you'll make me. I've never seen a perfect look, uh, roof in my life. Yeah. And anyone who says his roofs are perfect, let it inspect. Uh, let another roofer inspect your roof, and he'll find something. They will. He'll find high nails. I mean, you you put in two thousand nails. You telling me they're always perfect nails on. Right. I mean, come on. Right. Why do you think the, the, these companies spend so much time increasing their nail area? Right. Mm-hmm. If, if if there's, I always tell my daughter, if you see something, it came from somewhere. The seatbelt came from somewhere. There wasn't. That wasn't there. There was exactly. a problem. The lines in the road. So. And that product was bad. Like one line, you put a little. It, it was thin. It was like a chalk line. Yeah. You know, it was it was it was, it was super thin. That's why us. Well, then we're going to go to another product that has a thicker line because. It's our, it's less risk because then what's going to happen is you're not going to get your proper warranty. The shingle blows off. The company manufacturer rep is going to come back. He's going to go, ah, you didn't listen. You didn't nail line. You're like, "Ah, I'm never selling that shingle again. You know, so, excuse me. So yes, you can nail perfectly in a perfect world, but it's not realistic. Uh, You know, people are bickering and about the sales guys thing. Listen, you figure it out, man. I think I still would be working uh, for boss. Like uh, I started business after my boss of like two, three years filed bankruptcy. And all I ever wanted, just sell the job. I'll do the work. He couldn't. He literally put himself in a position where he was Robin Peter to pay Paul. And I was in a position where I'm not going to trust my well-being of my family in someone's hands. So I came home and said, I'm going to start my own business. But the thing is, if you want to work hard, if somebody's giving you work and you're making a good living, you know, with your hands, you'll be happy for the rest of life. But if you don't have the sales guy who's feeding you jobs, so you, you'll, you're not going to be able to. There's a lot of guys who enjoy, you know, I can make a furniture, I can do install floors, roofs, but someone have to give you work. You have to. Sales guy is there for it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Anyway, I think it goes both ways. I think uh, installers don't give enough credit to sales guys in this industry. Yeah. And I always say, like, you know, respect goes both ways. Yeah. Sales guys have to respect guys on the ground. And I think they do get respected because everybody, that's like sa- sacred. We recently um, blessed out one guy who was still in front of the crews. And the amount of feedback we got was insane because crews are sacred. Yeah. You, you can have dispute with a sales guy over commissions. But not to pay a crew yeah. completely for the job, yeah. I mean, yeah. you will get yeah. in big trouble. Yeah, don't ever complain about the other guy's job that you're not doing because everything's a, everything's a working part in this machine. This whole industry, and not even the industry, but just di- bring it down to dissect one's individual company, one transaction. Every, everybody's a, a piece of the machine. The sales guy, if there's no sales, you don't have a job. The crew guys, are you going to get out and sell? Okay, cool. And maybe there's crew guys that can sell, mm-hmm. but your numbers are going to be so low. You know, so you, you will have time to do that shingle <laughs> because you won't have other roofs to do. <laughs> Recently, someone asked in comments, why sales guys getting paid so much? And I would say they're not, but they're taking way more risk. Are you willing to work in commissions only when nobody's giving you a job, when you have to go and create your own paycheck? No, yeah. you're not. You just want to get paid for hours you work. Yeah. You're exchanging labor for That's easy. Everybody yeah. can do that. That, but that's why you're getting paid last because there is no risk. Yeah, and and you always hear in this industry, you know, with sales guys, a lot of it is either feast or famine, and that's why mm-hmm. they say that because so pay, sales guys get paid more because their, their their job and their risk is different. You know, you got you can say, well, you know, why does the hunter get the biggest piece of the meat? Because he took his butt out there and hunted. He could have died. He went out there and, and if he comes back with nothing, ha ha ha. It's like the it's like the punter who misses the winning kick. You got one job, you know, and if you don't do it, then you're the laughing stock. But if you do it, then you're the hero. You know, so with sales, we go out there and we win and we get sales. But people don't know the stories of how many you lost. 
You see a guy holding a fish and you're like, oh, he's good. You don't know how many fish he lost. The line broke, the cold days, the boat broke down. You know, there's a lot of stories behind it. So when a guy goes out and he does get the sale and he's making more, he's getting the reward. And I, I, I when people come in, I've always went back and forth with pay and how do you pay a sales guy? Because, you know, my buddy taught me this industry, but I'm still learning and it's not perfect, right? And I'm always learning. I'm always, how do you pay a sales guy? Right now, we, I pay them 10% off the top, but I think I'm going to change that. Um, I went from when, so when I first came in. This that's, in that's good. We do the same. Okay. Don't change it. There's no reason. Okay. It's easy to count. Yeah. Is it right? It makes sense. So when I first came in, it was 50 50, but it's, the, it's 10 50 yeah. 50. So it was the 10 50 50 versus the 10% was like the big thing. Which At one? Then it's going to be the same thing. Yeah. So by the time you do the same, it's the but same. it's hard explaining that to a sales guy. Yes. They're like, no, no, you're greedy. No, no, look at the number. And O&P and da, da, da. You're like, I'm like, Let's grab five files and let's run them commissions and let's see. And they're neck and neck. And sometimes the 10% wins and wins. Mm -hmm. I had a sales guy who tried to do that. He came in one time with like five or six files and he was like, uh, this one, this one, 10%, 10%, and this one I want 50. Oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't no. work that way. No, you pick a sales structure. Well, that's easy. You sell a million bucks, you make 100K. You sell 2 million, you make 200K. Yeah, nice and simple, right? Yeah. So, um, I, but, but I went back and forth with the percent sign versus the uh, dollar sign. You know, I put it like on a seesaw and I would, and my thing is i was so gracious i'm i think it was a mistake that i made is and a lot of people probably make is you try to treat people as you want to be treated with that one of my errors was realizing that some people need structure some people need the lines in a road otherwise they go in a ditch and i'm like i don't need lines in a road so i'm not going to give you lines in a road because i don't like it so i'm not going to do it for you but with some people then they go off the road so i gave people so much freedom in the in the beginning you know and i still kind of do but i say hey look you got a percent sign and you got a dollar sign Let's talk. What do you want? What do you, what's your life? Do you want more dollar sign? If you get more dollar sign, you get less percent sign. If you get less percent, you get higher dollar. Yep. You know, so I would kind of do that variance. And um, but then I moved. Um, I had another buddy in this industry, and I and he was like, Mike, what are you doing? He was like, Why are you doing profit sharing with them? He was like, Does any other company in the world do profit sharing? Do you go to McDonald's? Do you get a percentage of the of the, of the company? Exactly. He goes, No. They get you get what you pay, and that's what you get. And he goes, and that way you can grow your company. He goes, so if you work out with a, um, if you're funneling or whatever you're doing behind the scenes, you get your rebates for the company. Does that grow? You know, if the truck breaks down, are they going to help you? Et cetera, et cetera. So we moved to the off the top gross. Um, but I'm always listening to what other guys are paying because, you know, you're always just trying to improve yourself and keep your people happy as well. Sure. Uh, I wouldn't be me if I wouldn't ask this question. You recently, be you. Um, you, you did a... Uh, Constructor Rescue Show? Yeah, yeah. I'm a small company. I just got this office, dog. This shit costs, you know how fucking bills are now? What was real, what was fake, what was scripted, and what was the real life? You're funny. So, <laughs> so yeah, I did the Contractor Rescue Show with, with Anthony, man. He's a cool guy. Um, it was, it wasn't a hundred, it wasn't a hundred percent accurate. Um, it was just like every other reality show. It was based off of a general what's going on in life, with some exaggerations for entertainment. So I think on that episode, what we did was we started off at my old location and moved to the new location. Um, sometimes you do things for TV. So I was already kind of out of that office and into the next one. And But but we did it for the principal because it was, it was it's truth. It's based off truth. Sure. We just jumped timelines because he's only in town for a weekend. So we made it work. But it was it, it was exaggerated truth, I'll say that. But it was fun. It was fun. Did you really fire those guys or did they walk away or was it a show? In the moment, it was... Because it was very it was, realistic. I would, I would believe that. In, it happens a lot. In the moment what was happening, something happened and then we just exaggerated and went with it. Um, and I did... That guy had a history of that and I was kind of telling him the frustration. So he, they acted like Anthony and Joe was the guy behind the camera. He's a cool dude too. He's kind of a, a good producer will pull it out of you. If I know that you're here on the reality show and I see a contention, I'll pull you to the side and I'm going to pull it out of you. So, you know, it helped pull, pull out the situation and frustration so that we got to plant the seed and then we exaggerated what was going on. The funny part is that he did truly get fired as soon as, as, soon as they left. <laughs> you so know, after the, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, it was truth. It was based off truth, you know, and I think a lot of uh, owners are like that, you know, and that was definitely something that I had an issue with, which was feeling, um, you know, as an owner, you feel tied to not let your salespeople get away. You know, if I'm a, uh, on those uh, sleds, you know, the dog pulling, you lose a dog, you slow down. 
So you work everything to keep the dog there, but sometimes a bad dog is, is a bad dog. And, and uh, Have you ever felt like a hostage to your sales guys? Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, I have. I really have. And you know, and, and, and the worst ones are your friends, your successful friends. They're the worst ones, right? I got a couple of uh, buddies that like, they're entrepreneurs. These are the, it's, it's the same makeup type. It's the entrepreneur and it's the buddy and the guy who knows he can go every, anywhere because he's a producer, a top producer. Those are the guys that you feel most constricted by. The rock stars. Yeah, the rock stars. Oh my God. Kick it. Just, you know, they're like, I can go anywhere. I'm up here visiting. It's a store. I'm going to come here and I'm going to do a million dollar sales and you're going to give me this percentage. Otherwise, I'm going to go to my buddy's company. I got $200,000 sales right now and I got 10 inspections. And I'm going to do this. You're going to give me this and you're going to give me that. And you're already like, you're already getting the headache and you're like, you know, and then you want the money, right? You want the sales. You want this. You don't want them to be your competition, but it's just, you know, and I've been there and I've and I made that. And then your friend, you know, because it's your buddy. You know, they hear stories of the buddy and, you know, oh, Dimitri's selling suits. Oh, hey, give me a deal instead of me paying. You're your friend. I should pay full price and support you and promote you. But that's it, not real life. Real life is Dimitri. Oh, man, what is that? A hundred bucks? Everybody's willing to deal from you. Let me get it for 70. You know, what do you pay for it? I got that guy too. What do you pay for the roof? And this is a hotel I got one time. I was at a hotel and the guy was like, it was a hundred something thousand. He's like, hmm. I can get it done. Me and, you know, this guy's an investor. Uh uh-uh, uh, no, I know a roof doesn't cost that. Me and my boys, we can roof that. I said, yeah, but you didn't even know you had storm damage. And then you had to overcome, you had to get it paid. And I went through the process. He goes, well, what do you pay for your shingles? Which is a big thing. And I'm like, I'm in his, I'm in his hotel. And I'm like, well, what do you pay for a room? How much does it cost to let me sleep in your room one night? I said, I'll make, the, I'll make the bed myself. <laughs> I'll bring somebody to pay the bed. He was like, <laughs> good point. I see what you're saying. I go, yeah, well, it's what, $200 a night? Can you, can, can I sleep there for 50? What if I come there at two o'clock in the morning? Is it less time? You know, and I just negotiated with him and it kind of shut him down because it says, yeah, you understand business has a price and it's not a, it's not about what the roof costs. It's not about what your it's hotel room business. costs. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a business and it's a business model and we're trying to grow here. You know, and, some, and sometimes when you sacrifice yourself, whether it's paying a sales guy or trying to do too much for a homeowner, you're taking you're taking you're taking away from your long term goal of where you're really trying to end up. And you you just got to stick to your goals. You got to stick to your focus, and you know you're on a journey. And if you got to stay off that path and don't deviate off that path, because sometimes taking shortcuts, you get lost in the woods, and then you got to come back, and now you're further than where you were when you should have been down there if you would just stuck to what you should have stuck to. How can you describe roofing business to an outsider, someone who doesn't know nothing about roofing? Let's say I own a restaurant. I'm like, hey, Mike, you know, I heard it's profitable. It's easy business. Yeah. You know, I see a lot of roofing friends on the big lifted trucks. Like, would you recommend me start a roofing business? Like, I don't know nothing about it, but sounds like cool. I want to invest in it maybe. Describe roofing business to an outsider. From the perspective of investor or, or no, no, sales? Just, just what are we dealing with? Like, is it easy business? Is it hard business? There's good days. Compl- there's good days and there's bad days, like in everything. In my experience, we t- I tend to have way more good days than bad days, but that's all how you manage your life and how you solve problems in life and how you deal with people. Um, Minnesota, it's good. It's fun. We get paid nice per house here. Excuse me. We get paid nice. Um, but it's highly competitive in a small area. Minnesota is an area for anybody outside of Minnesota. If you look at us on the map, there's this huge state. But our, the cities are so small. We have, our cities are so small. We have two cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. They put them together. They call them Twin Cities. They make two cities one, one landmark. It's called the Twin Cities because they're so tiny. You know, if you go to Chicago, it's Chicago. This is Minneapolis and St. Paul. <laughs> you know, you drive past it, you'll miss it. So this is where the bulk of the people are at. Do you know the numbers? I don't know how many con- it's like thousand it's 3000 roofers, 15000 contractors. <laughs> it's just- but, but it's like everywhere. Everything yeah. like we, we went to the bathroom, True. there was like three companies in my building. Right. So it's it's highly competitive, right? It's it, it's it's a lot. But perspective. You could be the I, I gave you the example of a guy in the bar. You could be in the bar, there could be this many guys or this many women and this many guys. How are you feeling? I'm going to give me a girl. So <laughs> I'm not going home alone if I don't want to. And guess what? It's the same thing with the roof. I go out there. I'm going to get me some business and I'm going to get me some clients. I'm not worried. I'm not really worried about my competition because we're not the same caliber. So if we would drop you in the brand new market, Chicago, Atlanta, doesn't matter. What's your earning potential in the very first year 
uh, you're probably going to do the same thing. Start a roofing company. What's your earning potential? Brand new market, you have no connections. How much money Mike Holmes can make in a brand new market? As a sales guy or as an owner? I don't care. You, you, you I know, think I'll, initially... We're just dropping you with a cell phone, a $100 bill. Drop me off a cell phone, a $100 bill. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be a sales guy. I'm not going to try to be an owner. I'm not going to go buy a boat. I'm going to jump on a boat that's already moving because it's just smart survival. You got to... Love it. Right? So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going I'm to be a sales guy. I'm easily going to make six figures. I don't know the market. I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Honestly, sometimes I really love a fresh market. I love not knowing the market because my brain, I need to solve problems. I'm designed to solve problems. I need to stimulate. So if I'm not stimulated, then I'll get bored, you know, in life, relationship, whatever. So if you drop me off, I mean, easily, I can, I know I'll make six figures. Just It just depends on how fast I move through a town. I have a thing I just call, it's like, I, I call it work in a town. When I go into a city, I, I like, actually, I, I prefer rural places than metro and it, and it sounds completely backwards you know the, the nice thing about the metro is the houses are condenser it's more people you know it's just a numbers game it's you know you walk one block you can get way more houses than sure. city but for me i like solving the problem i get more out of a kick out of overcoming things and solving problems and meeting a person who didn't like me and now they love me and they're inviting me for dinner and uh, and they didn't think i was useful and they thought all these things, out of town or storm chaser. Oh, you're a storm chaser. You better be happy I'm a storm chaser. And you better be as the happiest storm chaser here. Because otherwise, you're going to get stick with the local guy who doesn't know nothing. Because if he was here, why isn't he helping you right now? It's like if we go fishing, you got the guy who throws a fishing pole in the water. And he's going to catch whatever fish he can. I'm a musky fisherman. I'm a shark fisherman. My tackle is only designed for one thing. And this is a specialty. And here in Minnesota, it's like, hey, if you got heart surgery, your grandmother or your mother has heart surgery, are you going to take her to the little shop on Main Street? Or are you going to take her to Mayo Clinic? Hmm. Mayo Clinic just showed up at your door. You're welcome. Let's go. You know? So I don't care. Wherever I'm at, I'm going to shine. So I'm going to do good in the market. I'm going to work the town. I'm going to go get the people. I'm going to work all the relationships. And but the end goal always going to be st to start your own? Or would you consider to work for someone? I'd work for somebody. I think if I went somewhere else, I would work for somebody to generate income. But I look for a company that has a weakness. I don't, that's what I would do. You know, I don't want to, you don't want to, I don't want to go on a perfect ship because you don't need me. I want to find a place that's struggling. Yeah, it has a little. Yeah, they have to be a little struggle. They have to have something that you can fix and you can come in and show your value. So I would look for a smaller company uh, that that needs something, and I would find the company that needs something. I go in there in sales. I prove myself, and after I prove myself, then I see if there's an opportunity there. Um, sometimes going and opening up your your company a company isn't always the answer. That's that's ego. Ego says. I want to work for me. I don't want a boss. I'm not going to listen. Oh, that's an, oh, starting a company isn't always the answer. You know what I mean? Sometimes getting together with somebody is the answer. If we're on an island and we're broke down and our boat, and we see a plane coming by or a boat going by, and I'm going, hey, hey, over here. And you're like, hey, hey. And they're over there going, yo, yo. It's just noise. But if we all go, hey, over here, hey, over here, it's going to be organized. And we're going to make more noise and we're going to get better results. So, 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 so sometimes teaming up with other superstars and other strong people and doing it with somebody else, you, your, your car, your boat, you're going to go faster. You're going to get further and faster. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to move, if you want to go fast, go with others. If you want to go further, go alone. So... Or is that it? Is it backwards? I don't know. Read it. Google it. Yeah. <laughs> but I think. But it's like that, yeah. you, you get the idea. You know, sometimes if you want, if you want to, if you want to, you know, if you want to go faster, go alone. But if you want to go further, go with somebody else. You know. So sometimes people just want to go fast, and, they, and they're looking for the bank account. They're looking for the quick check. So they're like, oh, well, I just want to get the check. How do I get the check? I can do it. And they get greed, and they do this, and they just want to grab it all. And it looks good, and it sounds good. And you get the check, but that's not the end game. You're not in it for the long game. If you're in it for the long game, you're going to organize. And uh, for me. Like I said, if I go work, work a town, drop me off in a new town. Let's have fun. It'd be good. Let's do it. Let's do a contest. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll work the town and I'll give one piece of game because I don't know who these people, who, who's watching. Sure. And I'm not going to do a lot of stuff to, to create too much more competition. I'm not going to tell you. We're not going to be a bar. I'm not going to tell you my line <laughs> and what cologne I wear. But I'm going to tell, you know, I always tell my friends this, what right? What cologne you wear? Hey, you know, right now, well, I got on, uh, I'll, I'll get you all this. Okay, so... <laughs> I got three cars under my arm and uh, three colognes under my arm in the car. Okay, this is a good question. I have Versace. Uh, which one is poor homie or whatever it's called? It's the, I have light, that the one. light blue one, right? Yep. Yeah, my man. Yep. All right, cool. Don't spray it near me. <laughs> and then I, I have Aqua de G. It just came out with a brown a, a brown bottle. I don't know what it is. It's flame. I'm giving y'all too much, man. Yeah. Oh, this is too much. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the last one. And the last one, Creed Aventus. It smells good on me. I know it's the yeah. number one selling cologne, but. That thing. I just I have a newer one that created a freaking love. That's my favorite. Which after Aventus. Uh, I forgot the name. Oh, after Aventus? Yeah, after Aventus. What it's color good. is it? 
It's a uh, it's crystal. It's it's a silver cap, and it's. Uh, and I think I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know what you're talking about. about. And and then so, but they're all dope, right? Okay, give me one pickup line with the three colognes, just one at a bar. <laughs> a pickup line. It's like a script. I don't do scripts. I just talk to a person. I just talk you know, to somebody. I, I, I just talk they, to they somebody. They want to hear it. Yeah, I just talk to somebody. I just ask somebody, how they doing? You know, how, how you doing? <laughs> oh, da, da, da. You got a man. Are you happy? That's a, that, that, that can, that'll hit home. You'll see right there in the eyes. How old is your roof? <laughs> how, how, yeah, how, how, what's your credit score? How old is your roof? <laughs> you know, let's go through the inspection. You know, but um, yeah, the clones all are different on different people. So, but the cologne creed has made me so much money. <laughs> Uh, $400, who cares? Spend it. Yep. <laughs> it has made me so much money. Blue Earth, that, that story. When I went down there, I sprayed it before I went. They, somebody, people took me around. Oh, come on to the volleyball game. We'll get you all the roofs. I went to, man, don't you know how, I, no exaggeration, literally had women crawling on me. Not an exaggeration. Literally like, oh, oh, oh. And late, late, this one lady walked up to me and then like, she just laid her head on my chest. She's like, oh. And I'm like, get off me. Like, I don't know where I'm at. I'm out here with these country ass guys. You're gonna have me fighting these guys. I'm like, are you? And I looked at her finger. I'm like, you're married, dude. Get off me. What are you doing? She's like, it's okay, my husband. You know what I did? I took my, I went to my car, grabbed my cologne. I said, where's your husband? And I sprayed him. I was like, take your wife on me. <laughs> so I sprayed him. I said, take your wife, man. She, she's like, he's like, she's like, he's getting something tonight. <laughs> um, but, you know. Um, why so many contractors failing? If, if the business is so good, why? In five years, 90% of contractors are out of game. In your opinion, you've seen a lot of guys come and go, come and go. What's your opinion? Why do you think so many business owners just can't figure it out? Is it a burnout? I'll be blunt. We were just talking about females. And in my head, and you might bleep this, but I was thinking pussy is good, but people fail in relationships, don't they? That's what I honestly thought. And I know y'all weren't like me, but that's what I thought. That's what I was thinking in my head. It doesn't matter if what you're going after is good. If you fail, you fail. If you're a failure, you're a failure. If you don't know how to handle something, you don't know how to handle it. It just doesn't matter. It's just like... Is it handle the money? What they can handle employees, handle the money? Just mental. I think ego drives the car and they put their mind in the trunk. And sometimes if you... Man, I... So e true. Ego, pride, all that stuff. It's all... Those are all... Being selfish. Selfish. In business for the wrong reasons. All wrong reasons, man. I, that's all. I get all the clear, all that stuff, man. It just... You have to be, like, balanced as a person. And if you're, when you're balanced, and just everything else works out. That's so it. people are going into business for the wrong reasons. Like I said, you could have something, and you could be in the greatest industry in the world and still fail. And then sometimes... A, here's the problem, I think. Sales guys know they're superstars at sales. They think that means they can run a company. Eh, wrong. No. And sometimes the best business owner in the world who can run the company can't do the sales. In my situation with my company where I'm at, I got my buddy Thad. He's like my unofficial partner. Yeah, it's my company now, whatever. But like he's, dude, without him, I wouldn't be doing some of the stuff I'm doing. That's just blunt. And if somebody can't say that, you got ego because you, you couldn't do roughing it. You'd have to take the camera and, you know, edit this. You need a team. You have I don't know how to edit. You know what I mean? But you have the right team. And when you have the right team in the right parts, then you can be successful. Some people want greed. They don't want to pay a partner, an office person, a production or whatever, because you're worried about the greed and the selfishness. One of the guys told me, he said, Misha, I would never uh, hire a receptionist. I'm going to keep that money. Stupid. Instead of paying receptionist, I'm going to answer a phone call. I'm not going to hire yeah. that person. I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, had, I had a business, I had a, a guy who came into town and he was like, I was like, dude, I'll, I'll give you some door knockers. And, and he was like, I'm not going to pay somebody to do this. And then I, and I don't want to pay somebody to do this. I don't want to pay somebody to do that. You got to, you got to, you got to outsmart the smart guy, right? So I go, his name was Joe. I go, Joe, don't think of it like that. I said, think of it that you're paying somebody to do your work for you. Don't think it was, if you think of it as you're taking a percentage or like they're taking from me. So you got to flip their mind. You're not doing that. You're paying somebody to do your work for you so that you can go sell. You're paying somebody to be your admin. So look at it like that. So when you're losing this percentage, you're hiring somebody. You're running your own business under my logo. And I'm just managing you to make sure that you don't mess up my name. And I'm going to help make sure the deals go good. So sometimes it's perspective. Perspective is a huge thing. You have to have proper perspective to see things right. Because if you see something and you interpret it wrong, your mind is going to think of it one way, and that's going to lead your feelings, and your heart's going to have you feeling a certain way, and that's going to guide your actions in a, in a certain way. And if your actions are wrong, whether you're running it, you don't want to pay somebody, you don't want to work for a guy, you want to do a loan, those are all coming from your perception. To, to, to 
fix the person, the problem, the sales guy, the business, you have to go into the mind. You got to dissect it. You got to say, why are you perceiving things that way? Let's look at it in the proper way so that you can process it and everything can come out right. Last question. Give advice to brand new business owner. Just starting, I don't care what his background is. Give him one or maybe a few tips. Brand new business. Take somebody with, with experience out to drinks. Four or five of them. If you're if you wanting to do something, talk to the people that are already doing it. You know, go, if you're getting into this industry, whatever industry, whatever part of this industry, because there's roofing, sales, crew, whatever, whoever's doing what you're doing and they're at where you're at, invest in yourself and buy them a drink, buy them a dinner, buy them a great steak, do whatever, because that's your education. If you're going to be a doctor, you're going to pay for school and you're going to pay lots of money for school. Pay to learn. People who are doing things, they love to talk. They love men love to talk. They're gonna they're gonna talk. They're gonna tell you things. They're not gonna give you all of it. Like I tell my guys if they come work with me and I know that they're entrepreneurs and I know that they're gonna try to open up their own business, I say, just talk to me about it. Tell me. Just don't steal my stuff and talk to me about it. As a friend, as a brother, as a coworker, I'll make sure you eat and you and you and your kids never go hungry. Like it's like fishing. I'll make sure you always get a fish. I'm not gonna take you to my favorite secret hole and show you my secret bait. But I'm going to make sure that you always eat and you're always happy. So let's just be honest about it. So if you're getting into this business, take out somebody who's doing it and talk to them. Make a friend. Somebody will mentor you because people who have done it, they don't want you to go through what they've been through and listen. And stop thinking you're smarter than everybody. Listen. It's like when you're talking to somebody. Some people talk like this with a closed fist and they're holding on to something. If you talk with an open hand and you're open and you can receive. So it's even like when I'm talking to people, if you even notice when I talk I would probably go back and watch this video. My hands are probably open a lot because I'm. this is a representation of my mind. I'm open. I'm willing to receive information. I'm willing to explain. I'm willing to, I'm willing to listen. I'm not one of these people or these people. That's, that's a mind frame. And I don't do that. So if somebody's coming into this industry, I say, honestly, be open. Look for people. Make friends. Talk. Listen. And know, and know what to do with your money. And if somebody tells you mistakes, I mean, learn from somebody else. If I, if I, have, a, if I have a burn... Figure out how I burned myself. You know, you see the bum on the street. A bum on the street can give you magical, great advice because he's going to tell you, hey, don't drink, don't do this or whatever. And they go, oh, you're a bum. I'm what I listen to you for. He just told you don't drink and don't do drugs. <laughs> he has some pretty good advice. <laughs> so advice can, good, good advice can come from anywhere. So just be open. And the more open you are and the more fair you are, you know, you're going to do all right. Love it. Guys, I know you enjoyed it. I know I did. Comment below. Uh, say something nice to Mike. Holmes, Black Mike Holmes. Black Mike Holmes. Uh, show him some love on this channel. Welcome here to the channel, Mike. Thank you so much, hey, sir. Man, thanks, man. It's been a uh, awesome. pleasure, man.